just imagine him exploding. Uh, but it's true. Uh, and what I'm surprised in this, and what may happen yet, we have from yesterday 49 days, so we have 48 days, I'm surprised that some Democratic or liberal or progressive uh, 501c4, super PAC, whatever you want to call them, hasn't just thrown $300,000 in here to take Kobach out. Because you really want to take him out now <coughs> if, you're, if you're a Democrat. You know, don't let him become a House member or a senator or whatever. Uh, you try to end his, I mean, he's like the Energizer Bunny, he, you know. He'll pop back, or maybe, maybe he'll whack him up. But you whack him down, he'll pop up. But uh, losing a race like a re-election for Secretary of State would be very significant. And I'm, uh, so, uh, that's where I see things today. Uh, and so I want to conclude, and it'll be a fairly long conclusion, uh, because I, I, I just finished writing a column that I'm going to go out this weekend. And this probably has um, my thoughts a little more coherently. It's only 600 words, so yeah. take a drink of coffee and uh, take a drink of water. Uh, and uh, this is a column that I'm going to it's going to go out. It never appears in the journal world. Uh, I don't know why. We've tried to get the journal world. There are five of us uh, academics who write uh, uh, in turn, and uh, the journal world has never paid us an ounce of attention. And I'm not blaming Dolph. Uh, Ann Gardner's never paid us an ounce of attention. And I think we're a lot better than a lot of the people they put in. But I would think that. It's called trifecta. Who would have thunk it? In deep red Kansas, we've got three red hot, state, red hot statewide races featuring three nationally prominent Republicans, Sam Brownback, Pat Roberts, and Chris Kobach. This oddity has sent reporters scurrying here from New York, D.C., L.A., and even London. No question, it's bigger than the world's largest ball of twine. <laughs> Overall, the national reporting hasn't been all that bad, but there's a kind of sameness. How did such competition break out in Kansas, of all places? Home to GOP dominance over 50 years of presidential elections and 80 years of Senate contests. 1932, the last Democratic Senate. Not all, but many of these reporters want to craft a national story about Kansas in 2014, with implications for the entire country. Maybe there are some. But 45 days from the election, these races are mostly about holding office holders accountable. Arguably, these three Kansans, Kansas incumbents have overreached, and elections are, mo are society's most powerful way of rendering verdicts on public officials. But their performances are not all of a piece. Indeed, Kansas voters must contend with three distinct red state records. First and most obviously, Governor Sam Brownback has established clear baselines for judging his performance on economic growth, job creation, educational achievements, and level, levels of poverty, among other issues. By and large, the judgments here have been harsh. Even as he and his allies argue that his self-proclaimed Kansas economic experiment is succeeding. Plunging tax revenues in a series of bond downgrades do not inspire confidence, nor do, mo nor, do most, nor do most objective analyses of the Kansas economy. It may not be fair to hold a governor responsible for the state's economy, given the great impact of national conditions, but more than any chief executive in memory, Sam Brownback has asked to be judged on his economic record. Lesson, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Judging Senator Pat Roberts' accountability is far different. Senators do compile long voting histories, of course, but these records are far less concrete than those of governors. A senator can end up on many sides of the same policy, as Senator Roberts has on two crucial issues for Kansas, funding for the recent farm bill and for the National Bio and Agro, Agro Defense Facility, NBAP. Moreover, Senators can vote for policies they know will never pass or introduce legislation that will be dead on arrival, claiming credit for their actions all the while. So in the end, the senator's record does not define his accountability. Rather, it's Roberts himself who, fairly or not, is increasingly seen as detached and out of touch. The genuinely funny Pat Roberts of the 18, 1980s, 
1890s and 1990s with his biting contextual humor. And, he, and Pat Roberts really, really was funny in his, in his day, he said. Uh, but he was voted the funniest congressman for you know, three or four years running. That's made, give you a sense the competition wasn't fierce. But uh, he really, really was funny. And I've seen him take people apart, including Governor Brownback, or sen then Senator Brownback, in just a wonderfully vicious way. Uh, so with his biting contextual, the genuinely funny Pat Roberts of the, the 80s and 90s, is, with his biting contextual humor, has been replaced by a grumpy old man. The former Roberts could have dispatched a Greg Orman with a few strokes of a stiletto whip. The current version grumbles and keeps yelling, Harry Reid! <laughs> <laughs> with recent polling de demonstrating real strength for Orman, Pat Roberts must successfully woo the Tea Party right that he so vigorously disparaged a few weeks ago. This will be no main feat. Finally, there's a fascinating case of Chris Kobach who must be kicking himself for not opposing the unexpectedly weak Roberts in the GOP Senate primary. With his crusade against non-existent voter fraud inside the state, and his anti-immigrant immigrant crusade outside it, Kobach has gradually come to resemble the anti-abortion zealot, <coughs> Phil Klein, ousted in 2006 after a single term as Attorney General. The intense politicization of an essentially non-political office prompted more than one Republican voter in three to reject his bid for renomination in the primary. And virtually none of these voters, the voters who voted for Scott Morgan in the primary, uh, none of these voters will support Kobach in, in the middle of one. So in the end, there's no single Kansas story this fall. Rather, voters in this certifiably red state would decide whether these re three Republican incumbents have overreached to the point that they should be turned out of office. Maybe, after all, there is a trend. It's called democracy. Mm. So that's my call. And my thoughts, and I'm, I'm, it's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So happy to, to answer any questions. Uh, yes, if I don't ask this question, somebody else will. Um, and assuming that this court decision about Kobach keeping Taylor on the ballot has not already occurred, because I think no, it hasn't. Um, what, I won't say what do you, do you think they should, but what might the Democrats do if Taylor ends up on the ballot uh, as, a, as a party policy at the state and precinct level? Well, it's a really good question, and let's be a little more general here about, about what, what, what could happen. Uh, first of all, he could be off the ballot, Taylor could be off the ballot, which really is Pat Roberts' worst nightmare right now. He does not want to go one-to-one -one with, 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 Greg, with Greg Orman. Uh, there's a Libertarian candidate, and in both races, the Libertarian candidate is not unimportant. For one thing, it means that you only have to get about 48, 47, 48 percent of the vote to win. So, uh, in a two-person race. Uh, the, the, the second thing is they kick Taylor off the ballot. They allow Taylor off the ballot, but they tell Democrats you have to put someone else on the ballot. Democrats will slow walk this one into the grave. Uh, they'll say, you know, say, well, we need a certain number of days to get our committees together. Well, you've got to print ballots, you've got to send ballots to military people. I don't know how they could do it, you know, and Kobach would be pounding on the table saying, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> and his head might explode. <laughs> i got a lot of Kobach exploding metaphors today. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sticking with those. Um, the third thing is, and I think... Before I read the stories, I thought the most likely, but now I think that Taylor might get off the ballot, is that Taylor's on the ballot, uh, with a D behind his name, and he's certainly going to get a certain percentage of the vote, 1%, 3%, 5% of the, it makes Orman's job harder, without any, without any question. Uh, because some people will go in and vote, uh, and they, some may know it and say, I just can't vote for an independent, I don't think Orman's very good, I can't vote for Pat Roberts, so I'm still going to vote for Taylor. But more likely is people just don't, you know, who go in, go in the ballot booth, haven't read much about the election, and just vote D. Uh, what Democrats will do, uh, first of all, they're, they're keeping their hands off this. Yeah, they, they don't want us, you know, they want no fingerprints on the Greg Orman race. But as they go out and canvass their votes, they're canvassing for Paul Davis, they're canvassing for Gene Schodorf, uh, and... Uh, <coughs> 
implicit in that, I think, and it may be explicit on, in a verbal, uh, you know, in a, in a communication on the doorstep. <coughs> uh, you know, uh, we'd, and I know that Chad Taylor's a Democrat, but you know he's dropped out. You know, you, you understand he's dropped out of the race, and that would be the the informal message all all over. Uh, if he's on the ballot, he takes say three percent. That could be the margin. Uh, but the, but I think there will be a lot of communication uh, that that Chad Taylor and I'm so you know it's, it's, if you're a Democrat, it's worrisome. But I don't think it is by any sense uh, the the end of the day. Uh, particularly if you've got a ten point lead. Uh, Phil, you, you had a question oh, before. Yeah. Do, 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 go ahead. Two points first. Monday's New York Times article about Kansas politics on the front page over the fold with a long piece in the back on a half page about the governor's race between uh, Brownback and uh, Davis. Today's Journal World, if you want to meet Greg Orman today, he is going to be at Pachamama's today from 6.30 to 8 uh, at 800 New Hampshire. I'm going to be there. I actually signed to get him on the ballot uh, to talk to him. Do you know where he's going to be before that? No. Okay. It's just, it's just a little ad here that says he's going to be there. I didn't see that. Open to the public free of charge. Wait, one oh, one. Yeah. Uh, Tim Miller is also like you. They won't print anything that he writes at the Journal World. And the last point, the question I have is, I don't follow it that closely, but Missouri politics, uh, Democratic governor, Republican legislature, they have overruled a bunch of vetoes. Would that happen here in Kansas? Uh, probably not. I think the House, right, the, the, the House that would emerge would, between Democrats and moderate Republicans, would probably uh, uh, not override the, the Senate would override it in a, in a blink. But the, but the House, I don't think would, uh, and, and the emerging House, and even this House, it, it, it's it's close. But I think I think. Even picking up two or three or four seats, uh, you would find a house that is going uh, uh, to be uh, resistant to uh, to to. But but the problem is the difference is in Missouri you've got uh, two how uh, that oh no you no you never mind you you were ahead of me. Do you think do you think that age will be a, a variable in the Senate race? Oh yeah, it already is without any question. Uh, uh, age, age, and age in residence, uh, both. Uh, the annals of U.S. congressional politics is littered with people who stayed on one or two elections too long, and they, they got weakened and suddenly. Now with Roberts, there was no sense from the last election that he was going to be weak this time. Uh, but there are all kinds of indicators from his performance, anecdotal, that that, that he hasn't and. He hasn't been much of a player in the, in the U.S. But Orman Senate can't take him on on the age thing directly. Will it have? Oh, to? doesn't have to. <coughs> All he has to do is appear on the same stage. Oh, okay. yeah. And you know, <laughs> here's Pat Roberts reading from notes and okay. yelling Harry <laughs> Reid and Orman. Now, I don't think Orman's debate performance was great, but I mean, okay. here's a young, vigorous guy. Oh, you oh, you never, right. never directly bring it up. Oh no, no, no. But you don't have to. What about Pax? Pat, what, about Pat, Pat? what about Democratic PACs? Would they might they bring it up? Probably, I think you would. What you would do is, is have, you know, those those awful, right. I say awful they, ads they are. that they would they would show Pat at his worst at his at, 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 at his at his worst. Uh, it was interesting that the debate analyses. Uh, I think one thing that happened in the debate at the state fair, which I listened to, I didn't watch, but I but I listened to. Uh, and I thought Orman was okay. Um, he, he held his own on this on, on the stage all all right. Uh, uh, but Roberts uh, uh, often old, went longer than his time. Uh, he often you know was kind of was kind of grumpy. Um, and I think that the Kansas media, by and large, gave him a pass on that. Uh -huh. He didn't drool. <laughs> uh, uh, he, you know, he didn't he didn't stumble off the stage or something, uh, and he talked loud. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I think that 
we'll, we'll see what happens in a subsequent debate or anything like that. But I, I, do, I do think, and, 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 in, and, and in several instances, it was just non-factual. Uh, but when you haven't, and this goes for the governor, uh, and I think for Kobach as well, when you, when you haven't you know, been closely tracking with the facts for quite a while, it's hard to get back on track with, yeah. with, with, with them. Yeah. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm not trying to be a jerk here, no. uh, although I'm kind of enjoying it. <laughs> um, I was raised in Kansas. I, I have not lived here for four decades. My impression, though, in reading, uh, uh, well, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the red state, I mean, it took time, obviously, but it was cultural. It was values voters. We don't care about the economics. We don't care if our kids get a college education. We, we have this, this culture that we want to protect. Right. Is, is that... Is that and the second part, then, if that's true, what's why is it changed? What's well, I really do happened? think you. Have, I do think you have the merging of social conservatism uh, and, and this Tea Party right of small government. <coughs> government not the government can do no good ever. Right. Period, except uh, to keep people from having abortions and protecting their guns and going to war. Uh, but other than that, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, so so I do think that that's uh, that the the. Evolution of the Tea Party movement uh, really has brought brought those those two strains uh, of, of conservatism uh, uh, t t together. Now, I, do, I also think what we're seeing is that has moved that right wing politics farther and farther to the right. Wow. And so there are people, uh, a variety of people in, in D.C. Most notably, uh, a couple years ago. Uh, my friends Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein wrote a book called It's Even Worse Than You Think and talking about the asymmetry of, Amer of American politics as expressed in Washington. That everyone says, oh, we're polarized, and we are polarized, and we're divided. But their argument, and, and I agree with it, is that uh, the Democrats have pretty much stayed in the same position or moved to the right over the last, certainly they've moved to the right over the last 30 years. Look at Bill Clinton. So, uh, but Republicans have moved way farther to the right, and so it's, it, it's not symmetrical uh, at all. And I think the problem for Republicans in presidential elections, not so much in, in <coughs> Senate and particularly House elections, but in presidential elections, they move so far to the right that they're close to structurally being uh, uh, incapable of winning the presidency. And I say close to because you never say never, uh, but... Uh, if you are so far over there, you've alienated Hispanics, you've alienated Asians, who ought to be on your side in many ways, economically. Uh, you've certainly alienated blacks, and you've alienated a lot of women. Uh, where do you win? How do you win that? You can win in, in, in some states, you can win in a lot of congressional districts, but you can't win nationally. So, uh, you know, I, so I think your point's well taken. Yeah. Uh, you have mentioned Wakefield Jenkins' campaign. Is there any, any reason to talk about that? No. Repeat, repeat that. Yeah. There's no reason. To, there's not much reason to talk about it. Anything I say about Margie Wakefield versus Lynn Jenkins as a political scientist will be construed as me attacking Margie Wakefield, which I don't want to do. Uh, but but I, I'd say that I, the most ironically, strangely, and for me happily, the most vulnerable House member in Kansas this year is, is Tim Hillscamp. Mm -hmm. Because he performed very badly in the primary. He's got a pretty good, unexpectedly good Democratic challenger. And there are a lot and a lot of Republicans that don't want, it, don't want Hillscamp in. I, don't th I think he'll win. I think he'll sneak through. I think Jim Shiro will probably, a Democrat winning in the first is really hard. But I think Jules Camp is, is vulnerable. I think the, the, the Wakefield Jenkins race is a very conventional Senate race, a House race. Margie doesn't have enough resources. Uh, Jenkins has more resources. Uh, you've got the top of the ticket folk, you know, sucking the energy out of a congressional race. Same is true with Kelly Catala and, and uh, <coughs> Kevin Yoder in the, in the, in the third district. Uh, I think Margie's run a great campaign. Uh, I think she has accumulated a fair number of resources. Uh, I, I think that in many ways, uh, well, I'll just let it go with that. I just heard on the web the former governor Anderson died. Yes. Who did 
Yeah, and John Anderson died today. My middle name is Anderson. Oh. Which, you know, kind of, he's 97. Really? Uh, you know, he's 97 and lived a good life. Uh, uh, and very representative of kind of a previous era of Kansas politics before re reapportionment in the 1960s. Kind of a, a you know, a, a tr very traditional Kansas Republican. But there's some really good guys. Uh, uh, Avery, Avery, who raised taxes and got defeated. Uh, An Anderson. Uh, I mean, these were people who, who uh, would come back, and I remember uh, hearing a yeah, there was a an ex governor's uh, panel about ten years ago, and I can't remember if it was Avery or Anderson, anyone there who just wowed people. They were all going to vote for him, you know. He's, he was he was he was eighty eighty six or something, and it was terrific. Uh, so I mean, these were guys who served for a couple of years, and they had and and, and they had political aspirations uh, that were, did or didn't work out. But uh, by and large, I think we've had a pretty good run of governors, uh, uh, particularly over the last, uh, say, 40, 40 years. So yeah, I, he's one of those guys I'd forgotten whether he was alive or dead. Uh, mm -hmm. No, he was alive, but not today. If the Democrats, uh, well, if three or four incumbent Republicans are defeated, do you think the Democratic Party will take that as a message to get get their house in order and get ready for the next election and, and maybe move this state to where we have representatives on both sides of these questions? Well, you know, I don't know how many people in this room know. My, my, my son is a communications director with his fancy NYU law degree. Yeah, he's the communications director for the Democratic Party in the state and assistant uh, uh, Democratic uh, executive director for the party. And so I, I know a disproportionate amount about Democratic politics. Uh, and they really have worked over the last two years for, on, on voter ID, on, on getting people out to vote, on recruiting more and more uh, uh, mem uh, you know, party identifiers, try to get good candidates, which was, I, was hard. You know, I do think what, what will happen is that the, the moment that, say you had those results, uh, the moment that those results were finished, the Kansas Democratic Party would turn its attention to uh, winning back some seats in the, in the Kansas Senate. Uh, and I think they would work with moderate Republicans, as they have this year, and there's a very clear alliance between moderate Republicans and Democrats in the gubernatorial race this year. Um, I think they would work uh, together to try to produce some kind of uh, balance where you'd have someone more moderate Republicans, someone more Democrats. Certainly, they're, they're, this is a very strongly conservative state in lots of ways, and you never deny that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess it's like, what's going you know, it's, it's 